Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the August 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of The Socialist Revolution and the Right of Nations to Self-Determination by Lenin from 1916. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this piece was written January and February 1916. It was published in April 1916 in the magazine For Boda No. 2, printed in Russia in October 1916 in Spornik Social Demokrata No. 1. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Moscow, Volume 22, Transcription by Richard Boss, and HTML Transcription and Markup by D. Walters. It's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. So, let's begin the audiobook. Section 1. Imperialism, Socialism, and the Liberation of Oppressed Nations Imperialism is the highest stage of development of capitalism. Capital in the advanced countries has outgrown the boundaries of national states. It has established monopoly in place of competition, thus creating all the objective prerequisites for the achievement of socialism. Hence, in Western Europe and in the United States of America, the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat for the overthrow of the capitalist governments, for the expropriation of the bourgeoisie, is on the order of the day. Imperialism is forcing the masses into this struggle by sharpening class antagonisms to an immense degree, by worsening the conditions of the masses both economically, trusts and high cost of living, and politically, growth of militarism, frequent wars, increase of reaction, strengthening and extension of national oppression, and colonial plunder. Victorious socialism must achieve complete democracy, and, consequently, not only bring about the complete equality of nations, but also give effect to the right of oppressed nations to self-determination, i.e. the right to free political secession. Socialist parties which fail to prove by all their activities now, as well as during the revolution and after its victory, that they will free the enslaved nations and establish relations with them on the basis of a free union, and, note, a free union is a lying phrase without the right to secession, such parties would be committing treachery to socialism. Of course, democracy is also a form of state which must disappear when the state disappears, but this will take place only in the process of transition from completely victorious and consolidated socialism to complete communism. 2. The Socialist Revolution and the Struggle for Democracy The Socialist Revolution is not one single act, not one single battle on a single front, but a whole epoch of intensified class conflicts, a long series of battles on all fronts, i.e., battles around all the problems of economics and politics, which can culminate only in the expropriation of the bourgeoisie. It would be a fundamental mistake to suppose that the struggle for democracy can divert the proletariat from the socialist revolution, or obscure, or overshadow it, etc. On the contrary, just as socialism cannot be victorious unless it introduces complete democracy, so the proletariat will be unable to prepare for victory over the bourgeoisie unless it wages a many-sided, consistent, and revolutionary struggle for democracy. It would be no less mistaken to delete any of the points of the democratic program, for example, the point of self-determination of nations, on the ground that it is, quote, infeasible, or that it is, quote, illusory under imperialism. The assertion that the right of nations to self-determination cannot be achieved within the framework of capitalism may be understood either in its absolute economic sense or in the conventional political sense. In the first case, the assertion is fundamentally wrong in theory. First, in this sense, it is impossible to achieve such things as labor money, or the abolition of crises, etc., under capitalism. But it is entirely incorrect to argue that the self-determination of nations is likewise infeasible. Secondly, even the one example of the secession of Norway from Sweden in 1905 is sufficient to refute the argument that it is infeasible in this sense. Thirdly, it would be ridiculous to deny that with a slight change in political and strategical relationships, for example, between England and Germany, the formation of new states, Polish, Indian, etc., would be quite feasible very soon. Fourthly, finance capital, in its striving towards expansion, will freely buy and bribe the freest, most democratic, and republican government and the elected officials of any country, 
however, quote, independent it may be. The domination of finance capital, as of capital in general, cannot be abolished by any kind of reforms in the realm of political democracy, and self-determination belongs wholly and exclusively to this realm. The domination of finance capital, however, does not in the least destroy the significance of political democracy as the freer, wider, and more distinct form of class oppression and class struggle. Hence, all arguments about the, quote, impossibility of achieving, economically, one of the demands of political democracy under capitalism, reduce themselves to a theoretically incorrect definition of the general and fundamental relations of capitalism and of political democracy in general. In the second case, this assertion is incomplete and inaccurate for not only the right of nations to self-determination, but all the fundamental demands of political democracy are possible of achievement under imperialism only in an incomplete, in a mutilated form, and as a rare exception, for example, the secession of Norway from Sweden in 1905. The demand for the immediate liberation of the colonies, as advanced by all revolutionary social democrats, is also impossible of achievement under capitalism without a series of revolutions. This does not imply, however, that social democracy must refrain from conducting an immediate and most determined struggle for all these demands. To refrain would merely be to the advantage of the bourgeoisie and reaction. On the contrary, it implies that it is necessary to formulate and put forward all these demands, not in a reformist, but in a revolutionary way not by keeping within the framework of bourgeois legality, but by breaking through it, not by confining oneself to parliamentary speeches and verbal protests, but by drawing the masses into real action, by widening and fomenting the struggle for every kind of fundamental democratic demand right up to and including the direct onslaught of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie, i.e. to the socialist revolution, which will expropriate the bourgeoisie. The socialist revolution may break out not only in consequence of a great strike, a street demonstration, a hunger riot, a mutiny in the forces, or a colonial rebellion, but also in consequence of any political crisis, like the Dreyfus Affair, the Zabern Incident, or in connection with a referendum on the secession of an oppressed nation, etc. The intensification of national oppression under imperialism makes it necessary for social democracy, that was the general term for Marxism in those days, not to renounce what the bourgeoisie describes as the, quote, utopian struggle for the freedom of nations to secede, but on the contrary, to take more advantage than ever before of conflicts arising also on this ground for the purpose of rousing mass action and revolutionary attacks upon the bourgeoisie. 3. The Meaning of the Right to Self-Determination and Its Relation to Federation the right of nations to self-determination means only the right to independence in a political sense, the right to free, political secession from the oppressing nation. Concretely, this political, democratic demand implies complete freedom to carry on agitation in favor of secession, and freedom to settle the question of secession by means of a referendum of the nation that desires to secede. Consequently, this demand is by no means identical with the demand for secession, for partition, for the formation of small states. It is merely the logical expression of the struggle against national oppression in every form. The more closely the democratic system of state approximates to complete freedom of secession, the rarer and weaker will the striving for secession be in practice. For the advantages of large states, both from the point of view of economic progress and from the point of view of the interests of the masses, are beyond doubt, and these advantages increase with the growth of capitalism. The recognition of self-determination is not the same as making federation a principle. One may be a determined opponent of this principle and a partisan of democratic centralism, and yet prefer federation to national inequality as the only path towards complete democratic centralism. It was precisely from this point of view that Marx, although a centralist, preferred even the federation of Ireland with England to the forcible subjection of Ireland to the English. The aim of socialism is not only to abolish the present division of mankind into small states and all national isolation, not only to bring the nations closer to each other, but also to merge them. And in order to achieve this aim, we must, on the one hand, explain to the masses the reactionary nature of the ideas of Renner and Otto Bauer concerning so-called cultural national autonomy, and on the other hand, demand the liberation of the oppressed nations, not only in general nebulous phrases, not in empty declamations, 
not by postponing the question until socialism is established, but in a clearly and precisely formulated political program, which shall particularly take into account the hypocrisy and cowardice of the socialists in the oppressing nations. Just as mankind can achieve the abolition of classes only by passing through the transition period of the dictatorship of the oppressed class, so mankind can achieve the inevitable merging of nations only by passing through the transition period of complete liberation of all the oppressed nations, i.e. their freedom to secede. 4. The Proletarian Revolutionary Presentation of the Question of the Self-Determination of Nations Not only the demand for the self-determination of nations, but all the items of our democratic minimum program were advanced before us as far back as the 17th and 18th centuries by the petty bourgeoisie. And the petty bourgeoisie, believing in peaceful capitalism, continues to this day to advance all these demands in a utopian way, without seeing the class struggle and the fact that it has become intensified under democracy. The idea of a peaceful union of equal nations under imperialism, which deceives the people and which the Kautskyists advocate, is precisely of this nature. As against this Philistine, opportunist utopia, the program of social democracy must point out that under imperialism the division of nations into oppressing and oppressed ones is a fundamental, most important, and inevitable fact. The proletariat of the oppressing nations cannot confine itself to the general hackneyed phrases against annexations and for the equal rights of nations in general that may be repeated by any pacifist bourgeois. The proletariat cannot evade the question that is particularly unpleasant for the imperialist bourgeoisie, namely the question of the frontiers of a state that is based on national oppression. The proletariat cannot but fight against the forcible retention of the oppressed nations within the boundaries of a given state, and this is exactly what the struggle for the right of self-determination means. The proletariat must demand the right of political secession for the colonies and for the nations that, quote, its own nation oppresses. Unless it does this, proletarian internationalism will remain a meaningless phrase. Mutual confidence and class solidarity between the workers of the oppressing and oppressed nations will be impossible. The hypocrisy of the reformist and Kautskyan advocates of self-determination who maintain silence about the nations which are oppressed by their nation and forcibly retained within their state will remain unexposed. The socialists of the oppressed nations, on the other hand, must particularly fight for and maintain complete, absolute unity, also organizational unity, between the workers of the oppressed nation and the workers of the oppressing nation. Without such unity, it will be impossible to maintain an independent proletarian policy and class solidarity with the proletariat of other countries in the face of all the subterfuge, treachery, and trickery of the bourgeoisie. For the bourgeoisie of the oppressed nations always converts the slogan of national liberation into a means for deceiving the workers. In internal politics, it utilizes these slogans as a means for concluding reactionary agreements with the bourgeoisie of the ruling nation. For instance, the Poles in Austria and Russia who entered into pacts with reaction in order to oppress the Jews and the Ukrainians. In the realm of foreign politics, it strives to enter into pacts with one of the rival imperialist powers for the purpose of achieving its own predatory aims, the policies of the small states in the Balkans, etc. The fact that the struggle for national liberation against one imperial power may, under certain circumstances, be utilized by another great power in its equally imperialist interests should have no more weight in inducing social democracy to renounce its recognition of the right of nations to self-determination than the numerous cases of the bourgeoisie utilizing Republican slogans for the purpose of political deception and financial robbery, for example, in the Latin countries, have had in inducing them to renounce Republicanism. Footnote from Lenin there. Needless to say, to repudiate the right of self-determination on the ground that it logically means defense of the fatherland would be quite ridiculous. With equal logic, i.e. with equal shallowness, the social chauvinists of 1914-16, to here Lenin is referring to the socialists of the Second International who told the workers to support the bourgeois war, World War I, and to side with, quote, their own national bourgeoisies. Apply this argument to every one of the demands of democracy, for instance, to republicanism, and to every formulation of the struggle against national oppression in order to justify defense of the fatherland. Marxism arrives at the recognition of defense of the fatherland, for example, in the wars of the Great French Revolution and the Garibaldi Wars in Europe, 
and at the repudiation of defense of the fatherland in the imperialist war of 1914-16, from the analysis of the specific historical circumstances of each separate war, and not from some general principle or some separate item of a program. 5. Marxism and Proudhonism on the National Question In contrast to the petty bourgeois Democrats, Marx regarded all democratic demands without exception, not as an absolute, but as a historical expression of the struggle of the masses of the people, led by the bourgeoisie, against feudalism. There's not a single democratic demand which could not serve, and has not served, under certain conditions, as an instrument of the bourgeoisie for deceiving the workers. To single out one of the demands of political democracy, namely, the self-determination of nations, and to oppose it to all the rest, is fundamentally wrong in theory. In practice, the proletariat will be able to retain its independence only if it subordinates its struggle for all the democratic demands, not excluding the demand for a republic, to its revolutionary struggle for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. Comment. I'd just like to pause there for a minute. So, Lenin is talking here specifically about the national question and the self-determination of nations, but let's take this principle in general because I think that it explains some of the confusion that, for example, Sokdems have about socialism and you know, sort of uh, their buy-in to a lot of the um, talk about, quote, authoritarianism and things like that. I think that this paragraph really speaks to the heart of that controversy in question. So let's read it again. In contrast to the petty bourgeois Democrats, Marx regarded all democratic demands without exception, not as an absolute, but as a historical expression of the struggle of the masses of the people, led by the bourgeoisie against feudalism. There is not a single democratic demand which could not serve, and has not served, under certain conditions, as an instrument of the bourgeoisie for deceiving the workers. So to comment on that, in other words, this is, in a certain sense, the bourgeoisie's struggle first, because they're the ones who are going to benefit as the next ruling class after feudalism. Why deceiving the workers? Well, the workers could easily continue the struggle on, not just overthrowing feudalism, but also overthrowing capitalism. But the bourgeoisie doesn't want that, so they have to manipulate and deceive the workers into thinking that capitalism is the end of the line, or that if you go further than that, it necessarily lapses into some sort of, quote, tyranny. Anyway, to continue, to single out one of the demands of political democracy, namely the self-determination of nations, and oppose it to all the rest, is fundamentally wrong in theory. So Lenin saying that there are many demands of political democracy, self-determination of nations being one of them, and self-determination of nations is no different in terms of being an instrument of the bourgeoisie potentially for deceiving the workers. So that's wrong in theory. And continuing, in practice, the proletariat will be able to retain its independence, i.e. from the bourgeoisie. This is something we're really struggling with today, particularly in that sock dem world of uh, buying into bourgeois interests, basically. That's a poor example. You know, in other words, that's where the proletariat is not able to separate out and keep independent its own interests from those of the bourgeoisie. Confusion of interests and you get class collaboration there. Anyway, in practice, the proletariat will be able to retain its independence only if it subordinates its struggle for all the democratic demands, not excluding the demand for a republic, to its revolutionary struggle for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. In other words, keep your eye on the prize. That is the thing to which we must subordinate all other demands, is the revolutionary struggle for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. That's what comes first. You must always keep that in mind. Continuing. On the other hand, in contrast to the Proudhonists, who, quote, repudiated the national problem, quote, in the name of the social revolution, Marx, having in mind mainly the interests of the proletarian class struggle in the advanced countries, put into the forefront the fundamental principle of internationalism and socialism, viz. that no nation can be free if it oppresses other nations. It was precisely from the standpoint of the interests of the revolutionary movement of the German workers that Marx, in 1848, demanded that victorious democracy in Germany should proclaim and grant freedom to the nations that the Germans were oppressing. It was precisely from the standpoint of the revolutionary struggle of the English workers that Marx, in 1869, demanded the separation of Ireland from England, and added, quote, although after the separation there may come federation. Only by putting forward this demand did Marx really educate the English workers in the spirit of internationalism. 
Only in this way was he able to oppose the revolutionary solution of a given historical problem to the opportunists and bourgeois reformism, which even now, half a century later, has failed to achieve the Irish reform. Only in this way was Marx able, unlike the apologists of capital who shout about the right of small nations to secession being utopian and impossible, and about the progressive nature not only of economic, but also of political concentration, to urge the progressive nature of this concentration in a non-imperialist manner, to urge the bringing together of the nations not by force, but on the basis of a free union of the proletarians of all countries. Only in this way was Marx able, also in the sphere of the solution of national problems, to oppose the revolutionary action of the masses to verbal and often hypocritical recognition of the equality and self-determination of nations. The imperialist war of 1914-16 to and the Augean stables of hypocrisy of the opportunists and Kautskyists it exposed have strikingly confirmed the correctness of Marx's policy, which must serve as the model for all the advanced countries, for all of them now oppress other nations. There's a Lenin footnote there. Unfortunately, most of it is missing. It says, reference is often made, e.g. recently by the German, and then most is missing, and it says, defend the latter and then the rest is missing. 6. Three types of countries in relation to self-determination of nations. In this respect, countries must be divided into three main types. First, the advanced capitalist countries of Western Europe and the United States of America. In these countries, the bourgeois, progressive, national movements came to an end long ago. Every one of these, quote, great nations oppresses other nations in the colonies and within its own country. The tasks of the proletariat of these ruling nations are the same as those of the proletariat in England in the 19th century in relation to Ireland. Secondly, Eastern Europe, Austria, the Balkans, and particularly Russia. Here it was the 20th century that particularly developed the bourgeois democratic national movements and intensified the national struggle. The tasks of the proletariat in these countries, in regard to the consummation of their bourgeois democratic reformation, as well as in regard to assisting the socialist revolution in other countries, cannot be achieved unless it champions the right of nations to self-determination. In this connection, the most difficult but most important task is to merge the class struggle of the workers in the oppressing nations with the class struggle of the workers in the oppressed nations. Let's read that last sentence again. In this connection, the most difficult but most important task is to merge the class struggle of the workers in the oppressing nations with the class struggle of the workers in the oppressed nations. Lenin is not saying that this is easy. He is recognizing it's difficult, but also important. Thirdly, the semi-colonial countries like China, Persia, Turkey, and all the colonies, which have a combined population amounting to a billion. In these countries, the bourgeois democratic movements have either hardly begun or are far from having been completed. Socialists must not only demand the unconditional and immediate liberation of the colonies without compensation, and this demand, in its political expression, signifies nothing more nor less than the recognition of the right to self-determination, but must render determined support to the more revolutionary elements in the bourgeois democratic movements for national liberation in these countries, and assist their rebellion, and if need be, their revolutionary war against the imperialist powers that oppress them. 7. Social Chauvinism and Self-Determination of Nations The imperialist epoch and the War of 1914-16 to have particularly brought to the forefront the task of fighting against chauvinism and nationalism in the advanced countries. On the question of the self-determination of nations, there are two main shades of opinion among the social chauvinists, i.e. the opportunists and the Kautskyists, who embellish the reactionary imperialist war by declaring it to be a war, quote, in defense of the fatherland. On the one hand, we see the rather avowed servants of the bourgeoisie who defend annexations on the ground that imperialism and political concentration are progressive and who repudiate the right to self-determination on the ground that it is utopian, illusory, petty bourgeois, etc. Among these may be included Kuhnau, Parvis, and the extreme opportunists in Germany, a section of the Fabians and the trade union leaders in England, and the opportunists, Semkovsky, Liebman, Yurkovich, etc. in Russia. On the other hand, we see the Kautskyists, including Vanderveld, Renadel, and many of the pacifists in England, France, etc. These stand for unity with the first-mentioned group, and in practice their conduct is the same in that they advocate the right to self-determination 
in a purely verbal and hypocritical way. They regard the demand for the freedom of political secession as being, quote, excessive, to feel for a long time. Too much longed for, too much desired, quoting Kautsky in Die Neue Zeit, May 21st, 1915. They do not advocate the need for revolutionary tactics, especially for the socialists in the oppressing nations, but on the contrary, they gloss over their revolutionary duties. They justify their opportunism, they make it easier to deceive the people, they evade precisely the question of the frontiers of a state which forcibly retains subject nations, etc., both groups are opportunists who prostitute Marxism and who have lost all capacity to understand the theoretical significance and the practical urgency of Marx's tactics, an example of which he gave in relation to Ireland. The specific question of annexations has become a particularly urgent one owing to the war. But what is an annexation? Clearly, to protest against annexations implies either the recognition of the right of self-determination of nations or that the protest is based on a pacifist phrase which defends the status quo and opposes all violence, including revolutionary violence. Such a phrase is radically wrong and incompatible with Marxism. 8. The Concrete Tasks of the Proletariat in the Immediate Future The Socialist Revolution may begin in the very near future. In that event, the proletariat will be faced with the immediate task of capturing power, of expropriating the banks, and of introducing other dictatorial measures. In such a situation, the bourgeoisie, and particularly intellectuals like the Fabians and the Kautskyists, will strive to disrupt and to hinder the revolution, to restrict it to limited democratic aims. While all purely democratic demands may, at a time when the proletarians have already begun to storm the bulwarks of bourgeois power, serve in a certain sense as a hindrance to the revolution, nevertheless, the necessity of proclaiming and granting freedom to all oppressed nations i.e. their right to self-determination, will be as urgent in the socialist revolution as it was urgent for the victory of the bourgeois democratic revolution, for example, in Germany in 1848 or in Russia in 1905. Quick comment here. What does Lenin mean that while all purely democratic demands may at a time serve as a hindrance to the revolution? Lenin has written about this in other works, specifically when the possibility of socialist revolution, the abolition of capitalism, becomes possible, i.e. you are in an active revolutionary moment where the abolition of capitalism is actually within reach, a real option on the table in that moment, then, and basically only then, is it a hindrance to put bourgeois liberties ahead of that revolution. In other words, we want all the bourgeois liberties and freedoms that we can get for the purpose of waging the class war. But once we get up to the revolutionary moment, fuck them, get the revolution. That's like the whole point of workers striving for the liberties that the bourgeoisie will grant you under capitalism is specifically to get up to that moment where you can end capitalism. They serve no purpose after that because bourgeois liberties mean that the bourgeoisie is still in power. Once socialist revolution becomes possible, then we'll take it from there after the proletariat has set up a new system in the wake of abolishing capitalism. So we can proceed with proletarian democracy from there. But what Lenin is saying is that the one bourgeois democratic right that will still be that important is the necessity of proclaiming and granting freedom to all the oppressed nations, i.e. their right to self-determination. He says, quote, it will be as urgent in the socialist revolution as it was urgent for the victory of the bourgeois democratic revolution, for example, in Germany in 1848 or Russia in 1905. So if when you're doing that socialist revolution, you're not proclaiming and granting freedom to all oppressed nations, you're fucking up your own revolution. It is, as Lenin says, a necessity and urgent. All right, continuing. However, five, ten, and even more years may pass before the socialist revolution begins. In that case, the task will be to educate the masses in a revolutionary spirit so as to make it impossible for socialist chauvinists and opportunists to belong to the Workers' Party and to achieve a victory similar to that of 1914-16. to Another quick comment, this is exactly what we're trying to do now, clearing out the Pat Sox, clearing about the Radlib pro-USA opportunists like Vosch, etc. We are trying to clear out, make it impossible for socialist chauvinists and opportunists to belong to the Workers' Party, to have an immediate influence, etc. Anyway, continuing. It will be the duty of the socialists to explain to the masses that English socialists who failed to demand the freedom of secession for the colonies and for Ireland 
that German socialists who failed to demand the freedom of secession for the colonies, for the Alsatians, for the Danes, and for the Poles, and who failed to carry direct revolutionary propaganda and revolutionary mass action to the field of struggle against national oppression, who failed to take advantage of cases like the Zabern incident to conduct widespread underground propaganda among the proletariat of the oppressing nation, to organize street demonstrations and revolutionary mass actions, that Russian socialists who failed to demand freedom of secession for Finland, Poland, the Ukraine, etc., etc., are behaving like chauvinists, like lackeys of the blood and mud stained imperialist monarchies and the imperialist bourgeoisie. So that's the end of that section. You can hear how important this is to Lenin that every country, all of the advanced countries which are oppressing other countries, if it is not one of the paramount first and foremost things that the proletariat of the oppressing nations is instructed in, is to support the freedom of secession for the colonies, for all the nations that are being oppressed then this is just a total failure. You're behaving like chauvinists, quote, like lackeys of the blood and mud-stained imperialist monarchies and the imperialist bourgeoisie. So I think that we are learning that lesson, but again, as we increase the organization, as we increase the education, etc., this is a point that is going to really have to be expounded on, emphasized, brought up in a hundred different ways over the course of subsequent years so that people really get the message, get many different examples of it, have exposure to many different discussions of particular situations, that's going to be really important. 9. The attitude of Russian and Polish social democracy and of the Second International to self-determination. The difference between the revolutionary social democrats of Russia and the Polish social democrats on the question of self-determination came to the surface as early as 1903 at the Congress which adopted the program of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, and which, despite the protest of the Polish Social Democratic Delegation, inserted in that program Point 9, which recognizes the right of nations to self-determination. Since then, the Polish Social Democrats have never repeated, in the name of their party, the proposal to delete Point 9 from our program, or to substitute some other formulation for it. In Russia, where no less than 57 percent, i.e. over 100 million of the population, belong to oppressed nations, where those nations mainly inhabit the border provinces, where some of those nations are more cultured than the great Russians, where the political system is distinguished by its particularly barbarous and medieval character, where the bourgeois democratic revolution has not yet been completed, the recognition of the right of the nations oppressed by Tsarism to free secession from Russia is absolutely obligatory for social democracy in the interests of its democratic and socialist tasks. Our party which was re-established in January 1912, adopted a resolution in 1913 reiterating the right to self-determination and explaining it in the concrete sense outlined above. The orgy of great Russian chauvinism raging in 1914-16 to among the bourgeoisie and the opportunist socialists, Rubanovich, Plekhanov, Nacha Diallo, etc., prompts us to insist on this demand more strongly than ever and to declare that those who reject it serve in practice as a bulwark of great Russian chauvinism and czarism. Our party declares that it emphatically repudiates all responsibility for such opposition to the right of self-determination. The latest formulation of the position of Polish social democracy on the national question, the declaration made by Polish social democracy at the Zimmerwald Conference, contains the following ideas. This declaration condemns the German and other governments which regard the, quote, Polish provinces as a hostage in the forthcoming game of compensations, and thus, quote, deprive the Polish people of the opportunity to decide their own fate. The declaration says, quote, Polish social democracy emphatically and solemnly protests against the recarving and partition of a whole country. It condemns the socialists who left the Hohenzollerns, quote, the task of liberating the oppressed nations. It expresses the conviction that only participation in the impending struggle of the revolutionary international proletariat in the struggle for socialism, quote, will break the fetters of national oppression and abolish all forms of foreign domination, and secure for the Polish people the possibility of all-sided, free development as an equal member in a League of Nations, unquote. The Declaration also recognizes the present war to be, quote, doubly fratricidal, quote, for the Poles. There is no difference in substance between these postulates and the recognition of the right of nations to self-determination, except that their political formulation is still more diffuse and vague 
than the majority of the programs and resolutions of the Second International. Any attempt to express these ideas in precise political formulae and to determine whether they apply to the capitalist system or only to the socialist system will prove still more strikingly the error committed by the Polish Social Democrats in repudiating the self-determination of nations. The decision of the International Socialist Congress, held in London in 1896, which recognized the self-determination of nations, must, on the basis of the above-mentioned postulates, be supplemented by references to 1. The particular urgency of this demand under imperialism 2. The politically conditional nature and the class content of all the demands of political democracy, including this demand 3. The necessity of drawing a distinction between the concrete tasks of the social democrats in the oppressing nations and those in oppressed nations. 4. The inconsistent, purely verbal, and therefore, as far as its political significance is concerned, hypocritical recognition of self-determination by the opportunists and Kautskyists. 5. The actual identity of the chauvinists and those social democrats, particularly the social democrats of the great powers, such as the great Russians, Anglo-Americans, Germans, French, Italians, Japanese, etc., who failed to champion the freedom of secession for the colonies, and nations oppressed by, quote, their own nations. 6. The necessity of subordinating the struggle for this demand, as well as for all the fundamental demands of political democracy, to the immediate revolutionary mass struggle for the overthrow of the bourgeois governments and for the achievement of socialism. To transplant to the international the point of view of some of the small nations, particularly the point of view of the Polish Social Democrats, who, in their struggle against the Polish bourgeoisie, which is deceiving the people with nationalist slogans, were misled into repudiating self-determination would be a theoretical error. It would be the substitution of Proudhonism for Marxism, and in practice it would result in rendering involuntary support to the most dangerous chauvinism and opportunism of the great power nations. Editorial Board of Social Democrat, Central Organ of the RSDLP. Postscript. In Die Neue Zeit for March 3, 1916, which has just appeared, Kautsky openly holds out the hand of Christian reconciliation to Austerlitz, a representative of the foulest German chauvinism, rejecting freedom of separation for the oppressed powers of Habsburg Austria, but recognizing it for Russian Poland as a menial service to Hindenburg and Wilhelm II. One could not have wished for a better self-exposure of Kautskyism. That's the end of the piece proper. However, there is a companion piece, a note to the theses, Socialist Revolution and the Right of Nations to Self-Determination, written by Lenin around the same time. It goes like this. There is some similarity between the way mankind should arrive at the abolition of classes and the way it should subsequently arrive at the fusion of nations. Thus, only a transitional stage of dictatorship by the oppressed class leads to the abolition of classes, only the liberation of the oppressed nations and real eradication of national oppression leads to the fusion of nations, and the political criterion of this feasibility lies precisely in the freedom to secede. Freedom to secede is the best and the only political means against the idiotic system of petty states and national isolation, which to mankind's good fortune is being inexorably destroyed by the whole course of capitalist development. That's the end of the note and of the entire audiobook. So, what did you think? I gave my comments earlier. We'll continue the discussion in the comments section below. Leave a question or a comment, and we'll take it up there as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful and have allowed me to spend a lot more time on this channel than I would have been able to do without that financial support. We don't run ads on this channel, so again, the patron support is vital. Thank you all very much for those contributions. Then, after the content is produced and uploaded, engagement counts. This goes for everyone. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, even if it's random letters, good video, thanks, whatever. Uh, all of that helps YouTube, as well as SoundCloud and anywhere else that this content may be posted in the future, to be recommended to more people. So. You can share it on your own social media. That's great. If you tag me, I'll probably repost or retweet your post of it. But even if you don't have a prominent social media account, just, again, the engagement, the liking, sharing, subscribing, you're going to indirectly help to put it in the hands of more people by YouTube's recommendations. Beyond that, organization counts, and it's one of the things we can't do through a YouTube channel. But look in your local community for organizations, parties, 
and other workers movement, you know, pieces of struggle that you can get involved in and support. That ultimately is what it's going to take in the end, real world action. Yes, you can learn things online. You can agitate and educate the organizing that happens out in meat space. It happens in many different forms, labor unions, community unions, tenant unions, all kinds of other mutual aid support organizations, political parties, on and on. Get involved in what you can. If there's nothing immediately in your area, maybe you can contribute resources or just join on more of a statewide or national level at this point. And maybe in the future, there will be more people in your area. But do look around and get involved in some organized activity. Thanks again for listening, and we will catch you in the next video.